Okay, I don't know what I was talking about before. I guess I was talking about, oh, we were going to put into understanding exactly how big uh, a number that is. Like, like um, how to put, how to understand what, what um, data is or storage is. And so you're... A computer, all the memories is just bytes, and a byte is eight bits. So eight bits can be represented by a hexadecimal with two characters. So let's zoom that up, and the 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 that's that's the first uh, the the values for hexadecimal are this. This is for a one byte. So this is each hexadecimal represents. Four, four bytes, so um, uh, represents a nibble, is what it's called, is a nibble. A nibble is four bits, so four bits equals to zero, 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 through one, 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 one. And in hexadecimal, zero, zero, zero is zero, and one, one, one is F. And this is how you count in in binary and it's really easy if it, this is the easier well look i'll start by showing you the more complex way and zero zero one one zero one zero 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 one zero one zero one one zero zero one 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 zero zero or one zero 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 uh, one zero 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 one one zero uh, one oh zero one zero um one zero one one zero one one oops, one zero zero one one zero one 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 zero one 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 okay and in hexadecimal it's easier you just go zero one Actually, I just do the decimal. So what this would be in decimals, zero, one, two, three, four, five. So we use decimal every day. That's what that's that's the human um, numbering system. Eight, nine, and this is 10, 11, 12, 13, and whoops, I put a space in there. 14, 15. And this represents 16 patterns. So therefore, 16. Uh, so this is 4 bits. 2 to the 4th power is 16. So there are 16 um, combinations. And that's, that's how you represent the numbers 0 through 16 if they were inside of a computer. and uh, But in hexadecimal it's even easier. It's 0, so it's it's all of these numbers with 0 through 9, and so 9's down here. And then it's A, B, whoops, B, C, D, E, F, and so there's just three letters, and uh, so in the numbers zero through nine, and that's that's what we mean whenever we say uh, when we say something like this. That this is the general representation of how an hex hexadecimal number is written whenever you write it on paper. This means hexadecimal number. If you're working in something like C, if you were to specify a value, this would be a hexadecimal number. It would start this way, and then you would actually put in your number. And so that would represent, this would represent in binary, this would be one, one, one. This would be eight ones, so one, uh, one, one, one. So that's an F, that's an F, that's an F, and that's an F. So this is the biggest number you can create in 16 bits. 
a 32-bit number is the the biggest one you could do there, which is like a is like a four billion. Uh, it's two to the 32 to the 32nd power would just be one 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 one. You know, up to um, 16 of these. And so there's. So you no, know, it's up to eight of these. So let me see. One, two. Uh, whoops, I missed one. There's none. So this is a 32. Wait one second. Did I get that right? No, that was I had it right the first time. So this is eight nibbles, and that's a 32-bit number. And a 64-bit, which is what we're using for our addressing at the at this present day when we're talking about a 64-bit computer, that's one that's got um, this many Fs, and so that's 16 nibbles. That's uh, an average day address. So if you're to address that ungodly amount of data that I mentioned a 64-bit address will never get past a 64-bit address. Um, we are, if we're accessing a terabyte of data, we are working with um, probably not, let me see, it's probably, a terabyte's probably going to be about this much. See, that's this is 15 times 4, that's, um, uh, or 16 times 4, which is, sorry, 30, 64 gigabytes, and this is 200, uh, this is 15, 16 times 64 gigabytes, so that would be, this would be um, 8, that, let's see, or get 32 and a terabyte would be a gigabytes um, to the 30th or um, yeah to the 30th to the 20th is a megabyte to the 30th is a gigabyte and then a terabyte is two to the 40th so um, we start off with 32 this adds a nibble which would be 36 and this adds and that's um, wait one second this is, that's a nibble, four, that would be four, four bits, 32, 36, that would be a terabyte right there. So that's 16 times 64 gigabytes, and that's, that's a terabyte right there, because that's 40 bits. And a thousand terabytes would be um, an F, and let's see. That would be 50, so we need we need 10 more bits. So two Fs would be that would be eight more bits, and then we need zero two, or we need uh, two. So that would be, or actually, it'd be three. So let's see, no, it would be two. It'd be two. And we don't, we don't, wouldn't have a one. If we did one, that that would be zero one, and then this is one zero. But to go any more would be a three, one zero, one one. So there's two, and so this is probably the biggest register that anybody will ever have anything to do with um, in this day and age. Um, until we can figure out what we can do with more than a thousand terabytes which is I think it's an exabyte I think that's what that is and I, I could check myself on that let's see what uh, um, exabyte what an exabyte is so it's an exabyte yeah two to the ten what? A billion gigabytes. Yeah, it's oh, an exabyte. Yeah, it's a terabyte is a thousand gigabytes. 
oh, uh, exabytes really big. That's like a billion. The get exabytes like that is what we're talking about when we're talking about 64-bit memory. So what is a um, thousand terabytes? Thousand terabytes is a terabytes is a petabyte is what it's called and so when you're working with a thousand terabytes we're talking petabytes and people don't usually talk about petabytes because a terabyte today is fifty dollars so you're talking about a thousand so fifty times a thousand fifty thousand dollars worth of memory um, equates to one petabyte so nobody is you know, unless they want to buy themselves a Ferrari, I, I are not going to want to, if they're going to sell their Ferrari or, I don't know, their Porsche or whatever it is, a $50,000 car, they sell off their $50,000 car just to get one petabyte of information uh, to store in their, in their computer. They could, they could address that because that's within a 64 bit address. Um, but, you know, the other thing is when you're working with 64-bit addresses, um, your data is being stored, um, can possibly be taking up much more storage just to store the address to address that memory, you know. Whereas the old 8-bit computers, the addresses were um, at the very basic with a Atari 2600 might uh, a video game system might use only an 8-bit uh, register for an address. That's kind of stupid. Usually it would be 16 bits. So 16 bits, you're represent, you're accessing 64 kilobytes of memory. Um, and that, so an old Commodore 64 probably could only address 64 ki kilobytes of memory because it was a 16-bit machine. It was an 8-bit machine um, but it really wasn't. It was a 16-bit machine. It worked in 8-bit registers, but it, um, I mean, it had 8-bit eight, eight um, commands. It didn't have 16-bit commands. It had 8-bit commands. So it was working with a limited number of registers, probably only four registers, maybe eight registers. And then for each register, there would be a separate um, instruction so it was probably only four registers. Let me see how many registers were in the Commodore 64. Commodore 64 registers. Um, processor registers in a six in a Commodore 64. The X register let's see what out it was um, separated up inside of them how much memory register memory that have so six six five ten so I say six five ten register memory so let me say six five out ten let me see chip they probably they'll probably show what a six five ten looks like on the processor. So this is a 6510. This is what a Commodore 64 used. Actually it was a 6502. And, uh, I think that was what it was. C64. Was it a 6510? I guess it was a 6510. No it was a 6502. That was what it was. Oh, the 6510 was used. I thought it was the 502 was used. 
Okay. Um, so we go to the five oh the six five ten and They might be able to tell us how many registers it actually used. Uh, they're not really saying much, are they? No, that's just a reference to memory maps. Six five ten architecture. the image you can probably get an image map here okay and this will show it oh good deal thank you finally show me the internal the it had an X and a Y register so it had only two registers in it and doesn't tell what the widths of those registers are. I'm guessing they're just 8-bit registers. And uh, you're, you had like only a certain number of, let's see, the wiki books, this 6502 assembly. And uh, these are the assembly load see let me see absolute a zero page relative absolute index so each one of these is a command zero page indirect load and store so this was you know, this would tell you like what each byte in the in in the code would work, do. You know. So you what you do is you get one of these manuals, and um, this is the way the old guys like Stephen Wozniak and them would program computers because they didn't have a computer in their home. So they couldn't sit down and start programming uh, on their computer because nobody could afford a computer at that time. In fact, it was Steven Wozniak's whole dream to own his own computer. That's what drove him to make the first Apple computer was he wanted to have his own computer. He didn't really, he had no plan of like actually selling it. That was Steve Jobs you know, sitting over his shoulder saying, you know, we could bark at this, you know. And Steve Wozniak's like, what? I, all I want is a computer. I just want to have my own computer at home. That was the drive for Linux. Um, um, you know, this is like 20 years later, um, Linus Torvalds, he's, he's thinking, I just want to have my own operating system. I want, I have my own computer, but I want my own Unix like operating system. And so it, every step, every big leap in technology is a, from a guy that's just wanting something that is usually costs a lot of money, but, um, you can't get it without writing your own software. And so Linux came as a result of Linus Torvalds wanting his own Unix operating system because to buy Unix at the time was like several thousand dollars and then you needed to have a computer that would support that um, type of operating system. So you needed like um, eight megabytes of memory or something in order to run Unix on your PC. And so you would you buy the PC, which would be like $2,000, and then to get Unix would be another $2,000. And in Helsinki, Finland, uh, $2,000 in American money might have been a lot more money. And so Linus was saying, I, I, if I want to do my research at home, I'm going to have to 
I'm going to have to come up with my own Unix operating system. So that's what he was doing. Um, what Steven Wozniak was doing 10 years, 20 years before was saying, I would just like to have my own computer. I would like to have something I could type at and use a terminal, a screen, use my TV screen, because he eventually figured out that you could use just a TV screen. You didn't have to get a computer monitor because the monitors cost way too much money. So that they would use a TV screen for their input. And if you could use the TV screen, the TVs were pretty easy to come by. So that was like $500. And then all of the little microchips that you th throw together, he figured out a way to reduce that. And so we can go back to the triumph of the nerds and we go back to when Wozniak was talking about, yeah. And their main function was to get us confused with some other guy named Cringely who was a deadbeat and had a criminal record. Eventually, computer terminals did begin to appear in some schools, but most of us paid no attention but there was usually one kid who did pay attention, falling in love with the digital purity of those ones and zeros. He was the nerd. And I took this book home that described the PDP-8 computer, and Oops. it just, oh, it was just like uh, a Bible to me. I mean, all these things that, for some reason, I'd fallen in love with, like you might fall in love with um, a card game called Magic, or you might fall in love with doing crossword puzzles or something else, or playing a musical instrument. I fell in love with these little descriptions of computers on their inside, and it was a little mathematics. I could work out some problems on paper and solve it and see how it's done, and I could come up with my own solutions and feel good in, inside. So you would keyboard these commands in, and then you would wait for a while, and then the thing would go ta 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 and it would tell you something out. But even with that, it was still remarkable, especially for a 10-year-old, that you could write a program in BASIC, let's say, or Fortran, and actually, this machine would sort of take your idea and it would, tr it would sort of execute your idea and give you back some results. And if they were the results that you predicted, your program really worked, it was an incredibly thrilling experience. So let me, let me get to the part where uh, Wozniak's talking about creating the, uh, creating the apple. So I think it's right in here that he starts talking about it. So Steve Wozniak was the technical wizard, and Steve Jobs was the visionary who saw microcomputers as a possible business. The first Apple computer was primitive. It was cobbled together by Woz to impress his friends at the homebrew meetings. Everybody was interested in computers, so I started getting a crowd around me, because even though I was too shy to raise my hand and say anything in a club meeting, after the club meetings, I would put my, my computer that I had built, and every week it had a little bit more working on it too. But I would set it down and let people type on the keyboard, I would explain what's in it. If they come up to me and ask a question, I can answer. Um, you know, nowadays I would have the ability to tell them what it is, you know, and be a little bit more promotional, but back then I could only answer questions that they asked me. But I got a group that started gathering around me. And Steve Jobs saw that I had a lot of interest around me at the club, and he said, let's start selling it and uh, let's make this company, came up with the name Apple, and, uh, and uh, that's how it started. Apple was at best a funky company, started by a couple of teenage hackers who previously had been working as Alice in Wonderland characters in a local shopping mall. And they started it in this garage right here. The first Apple computer was built here. Now there are more than 10 million in use around the world. And I was there, well, for a short time, I was an employee at Apple Computer, employee number 12, and one day I helped move materials out of this garage. At the time, Steve Jobs said the company was short of loot, so he offered to pay me in company shares, but I held out for the money. My mother still reminds me of that incident. The Apple I was even less of a computer than the Altair, a single circuit board that came with neither a case nor a keyboard. Still, Steve Jobs managed to sell 50 Apple Ones. That experience showed Jobs that there was a market for a real computer, the Apple II. It was very clear to me that while there were a bunch of hardware hobbyists that could assemble their own computers or at least take our board 
and add the transformers for the power supply and the case and the keyboard and go get a, you know, et cetera, go get the rest of the stuff. For every one of those, there were a thousand people that couldn't do that but wanted to mess around with programming, software hobbyists, just like I had been when I was, you know, 10, discovering that computer. And so my dream for the Apple II was to sell the first real packaged computer. Steve Jobs' dream was impossible. It needed too many chips, making the product too complicated and expensive to build. But Woz didn't know it was impossible. And then I got into a way of why have memory for your TV screen and memory for your computer make them one? And that shrunk the chips down, and I shrunk the chips here, and why not take all these timing circuits? I looked through manuals and found a chip that did it in one chip instead of five, and reduced that. And one thing after another after another happened. I wound up with so few chips. When I was done, I said, hey, a computer that you could program to generate colored patterns on a screen, or data, or words, or play games, or anything. And it was just the computer I wanted, you know, for myself, pretty much. And, uh, but it had turned out so good. He said, I think we have a computer we could sell a 1,000 a month of. I thought, how could you sell a 1,000 a month, you know? But we needed some money for tooling the case and things like that. We needed, we needed a few hundred thousand dollars. That was a lot of money for two people who had nothing in their lives to speak of, didn't have a $400 bank account. So I went looking for some venture capital. The scruffy 19-year-old seduced the conservative world of venture capitalists. The man Jobs persuaded to part with his cash was Arthur Rock, the inventor of venture capital and the man who had originally funded Intel. At least the Intel boys had graduated from university and owned suits. Well, he uh, wore sandals and he uh, had long, very long hair and uh, beard and Anyhow, a mustache. That that will get into how how he got uh, the Apple. It was and it was Steve Jobs. Um, Steve Jobs is really not a hacker. Um, Bill Gates is a really a hacker, but Steve Jobs is not. Bill Gates um, really wasn't the business guy. It was Steve Ballmer was the business guy. Um, Steve Jobs was kind of not quite as much of a hacker as um, as the, the guy uh, Steve Allen or I mean um, I think that's his name. So I think it's Steve Allen, isn't it? Steve Allen was the uh, you know these names escape me. So Steve Allen is no that's a that's a different Allen uh, uh, Microsoft it's not it's Paul Allen that's okay that's right Paul Allen is the guy that, uh, he was the guy so there was Balmer uh, Paul and, uh, and Bill and uh, and Steve Ballmer. Okay, yeah. Get these names kind of mixed around in my head. I, I knew Steve Allen wasn't it. I was like, no, nah, there's something wrong here. Uh, so it's Paul Allen. Paul Allen was the guy who, um, he was the real nerd behind Microsoft. And he got cancer and, or he was get he, 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 he was undergoing some sickness. And I think it was cancer. He had a cancer threat. And uh, Bill and Steve Ballmer were deciding how they were going to get his shares, how they're going to get him uh, out of the company. Because uh, if he went downhill, they, they would there would be something wrong. And Paul got wind of it, and he decided to just leave the company because he didn't want to like be sitting there messing with these two guys that were more concerned about money than they were about him so I think Paul got out of the out of the business uh, and just took his shares and you know he didn't I don't know if he's I guess he sold off his shares I'm not sure but um, but uh, Steve Wozniak was the brains and I mean was the computer brains behind Apple and Steve Jobs was more a manager type guy, you know, a business manager type guy. And he had some, I mean, he, when he, I, I watched an Atari documentary and yeah, he worked for Atari, but he didn't know how to program, you know, he, he, um, 
Nolan Bushnell gave uh, Steve Jobs a job uh, at Atari, but but uh, he knew, but he didn't know anything about how to program. It just you know, Bushnell was like, oh yeah, you you made this Apple stuff, or you know, you know maybe you can do it, you know. Or, I don't know if he was if he had anything out at that time if they had the Apple computer yet, but um, I think they guess they had the Apple One maybe, and then Steve Jobs. I don't know the chronology of when that came about, but um, uh, there is a documentary on it's on. Uh, it's on Prime. You can go up on Prime Video and uh, Prime Movies and look up the um, the Atari, the story of the Atari. It's a I don't remember the exact one, but it's got Nolan Bushnell on there talking about uh, how he created the computer, and they got Steve Jobs to like come and uh, do some, you know, work on something, but yeah. But Steve Jobs is not really a nerd. He's not really a programming guy. He's just a guy that knows what he, how to, how to get the most out of people, and so he's not really even a vision. I mean, he's a visionary, but he's, it, to call him really the visionary is is kind of, you know, re- putting too much. He's really good as a motivational, inspirational guy. He can he can see how things would be used in the future. Um, but he isn't the guy that would sit there and think of them first. Um, he was on the scene. Let's say he was good. He, he could see the opportunity and he, and he took a hold of it. Um, he was, he was good at getting people to work together on projects, but he wasn't really a very, I mean, he could probably do some coding, but he wasn't that what he will say when he was working on the Apple, what his biggest contribution to the Macintosh was calligraphy, because he took some calligraphy in college. And uh, so, but Steve Wozniak, if it wasn't for Wozniak, there wouldn't be an Apple at all. And so what Wozniak did, and I can describe some of what he did, and I'll put that on a document. Uh, so let me see let me open up a document create a document and we'll get this up in full full view I'll make this icon big and what steve wozniak did is um he he um he, he figured out how to address video memory um how to address, uh, how to manipulate um, the signal that went to a TV. And so a, a TV works at um, the exact frequency that uh, NTSC works at. So let me look up the NTSC signal. So NTSC, NTSC signal. Um, the frequency was 29.97 so I think that was frames per second so it's like 1.25 megahertz or something like that but um, what what uh, Steve Wozniak did is he just like hooked he just hooked the um, he hooked the output of some chips and he used a he used a, a clock of a certain frequency and he ran it through some chips and uh, was able to manipulate the pixels on the screen you know the he was able to manipulate the scan lines so a this is the exact frequency this is the number of frames per second this is the reason why a lot of people that like throw stuff up on YouTube and they convert from VHS and they go straight to uh, straight to um, 30 frames per second they're missing off on about 0 0.03 they got a 0 0.03 error on their frame conversion and so what happens is the audio signal tends to be a little bit off from the video and it gets to be a lot after a while 
and so you'll end up with video that will have will be out of sync with the audio and it's because the people did a 30 frame per second a, a NTSC 29.97 frames per second to a 30 frames per second conversion from a VHS signal to a to a computer's um, video frame rate and actually this 29.97 frames per second is not completely true um, this is what it is for odd it's it's actually twice this because um, on a TV it fills in it has an interlace uh, signal it does even in odd frames so it's actually it's closer to 60 frames per second so it would be like not 29 it would be twice this so two times 29.97 is your actual frequency because you're um, doing I don't know if that's right was it was it actually 30 frames per second or did they do a full 60 frames I was pretty sure the NTSC signal did 60 frames yes Sixty fields, thirty frames per second. Sixty hertz system for transmission. So the thing was, is that it would do um, thirty frames per second for sixty. What is that? It doesn't sound right. Yeah, I think I think it was. I think it was sixty frames per second. With the NTSC signal. How is 25 frames per second? NTSC had 30 frames per second and 60 frames per second. And what the the reason why is because you know that NTSC color system make space for color subcarrier so they're talking about that so um that's the actual frequency but when steve wozniak was working working with it he couldn't under, he couldn't do 60 frames per second he was working with 30 frames per second video signals and so but what he was doing was he had a, a thing called a clock and a clock, what it is, is it's is it's like your clock you have in your watch, but it um, counts in bits, and so it it goes. It would if it was a 16-bit clock, it'd go from one to to like one 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 one. It would go from zero to one on that. So it'd go from zero 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 zero. You know, four from eight zeros to eight ones. So 16, or that, um, actually that's 8 bit. So we go to 16, you know. So it would do 16 bits and it would just count um, over and over, go from 0 to 65,536 and then back to 0, and then it just keep going that over and over again. That's a 16 bit clock. A 32 bit clock would count, um, it would do 4, four gigabytes, so it would count in 4 gigabytes. And it would do it at a certain frequency and um, what you would do is you would use a modular a module mod operator which means the remainder of a division so um, if you um, were sitting there manipulating a vid video signal you would be trying to sync up what you would be doing is you would be sitting there uh, messing with the analog output from the computer I mean you would be using a digital circuit to mess around with an analog signal and you would be sitting there like trying to see if you could create a pixel on the screen so you um, that's really all he was doing was he he wasn't even working with colors he was working with trying to create a blip on the screen so you know he would be pumping like stuff like this out 
to the analog, uh, to the RF modulator or whatever that was hooked up to the TV, and it would be generating pixels inside of the com inside of the screen, but to map that to 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 actually store um, if the screen if you were able to produce 3200 by 200 pixels on a on a TV screen which is kind of the limit for the old computers the Commodore 64 this is what the limit of its of its uh, graphics addressing was 320 by 200 was the limit of us uh, because you had what was it 40 characters times 8 equals um, yeah that was some um, 80 160 320 so that was 320 pixels and then the they were eight down but you could only create 25 characters so 25 times 8 equals um, 50 100 200 so it was that was the limit of a Commodore 64 it, it could only address uh, 320 by 200 now I don't remember what it was for an Apple it was something of the nature of something like that but what they what uh, Steve Wozniak found is that he could get colors by um, by getting um, getting the scan ray to start manipulating the RGB values of it. so the red there would be a red pixel and then a green pixel and then a blue pixel um, subpixel of the screen so the individual elements of red green blue and he could mess around with putting a one there and a zero there and a zero there that would get you red so that would get you red and so if you went through all the binary combinations you could do red green blue you would, it would go zero zero one zero one zero zero one 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 zero zero one zero one 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 zero one 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 okay so this is actually that's black um, this is black and anybody who's done graphics uh, knows what I'm doing here blue and uh, green and this is yellow or no this is uh, cyan and this is red and this is purple and this is yellow and that's white and so the first Apple I mean the first Apple computer could probably only address this many colors the Commodore 64 could address uh, um, um, four bits of color so that it was this but then it was light blue light green light cyan light red light purple light yellow white you know something like that and rather than just uh, there would be a gray there would be several levels of gray and then there would be these colors um lighter versions of these colors and that was what the commodore 64 was able to address and um but how he got the colors was by manipulating he, he was since a scan since the scan of the as the crt works it has this electron beam that's going across the monitor and it's doing it it's doing it over and over again it's just drawing each line on the screen and it does it in even odd uh, strokes so it'll do one line and they'll skip a line they'll do another line skip a line then do another line and then on the second frame it would do all the even so it would skip the first line it would do the evens and then it would do the odds and then it would do the evens and um, it would do this at a certain frequency which would be 29.97 Hertz for um, for just each field and so actually for each two fields that it would do 29.97 Hertz that's 29.97 uh, frames per second 
And he had to come up with a way of syncing with this thing, um, coming up with a clock that would work at that rate. So um, you could probably do the computations. This is, this is how you would think it up. Um, you would do 320 by 200. So that's, how much is that? 64,000. So there are 64,000 pixels on the screen. And uh, actually this, um, you, you have to um, address the individual primaries. So 64,000 times three, and that's 192,000. And um, then you have to do it 29.97. So you say 29.7 times, um, times 19, 2000, like that. And you needed a clock that could do um, five megahertz or something. And, um, see, this is, that's a kilohertz. This is a megahertz. So 5.7 megahertz, you had to somehow um, you know, work at that frequency in order to manipulate the signal. Well, that's just for one second. You probably didn't need that much. The, all you need to do is for one or for every two frames. So it would probably actually be um, just for, you just need to mess with two frames. You don't have to, because you weren't doing animation. So all you needed was something you, you would need to take this number and divide it by your clock frequency and so your clock frequency might be one megahertz so you're dividing uh you're dividing 38 for three eight four one thousand and that would be oh whoops the other way around actually Oh, this is one, one, two, three, one, two, three. And that would be 2.6. So you would be, you would probably be doing, you, you would have to be doing a little bit of math to determine what frame you were on, but you would be sitting there using the, the, clock to um you would be using some electronics to sync up with that screen so once he was able to sync up with the screen and it was able to manipulate consistently one pixel because otherwise the pixel the drawing would be all over the screen the dots would be like out of sync with the screen so they would be bump, jumping all over the place once he was able to sync it up and he probably had a potentiometer, which is like a little, which is a little dial. And he could sit there and adjust the frequency at which it would sync with the screen. In fact, some of those old computers actually had something on it that you could actually adjust um, how it would sync up with the screen or the screen would sync up with the computer and uh, on the TV. And so you had to make adjustments for the video signal that was coming in. And um, so you would have, once you were able to, uh, and this is what people do whenever they're engineering, or engineering a computer, is they're trying to get things to sync up to, for things to match the frequencies. Like the, um, the Amiga computers, the CPU on the computer was synced to a to a clock that was multiples of the NTSC um, frequency, the video frequency. That's the reason why the video toaster was first put on an Amiga and not a PC was because the Amiga was designed to work with uh, with uh, video signals. They, de they designed it from the very beginning that the, the processor would be working with a video signal that the graphics processor inside of it would be working kind of in tandem with the CPU with a video signal. And so um, there's a thing in there called a copper or a coprocessor. 
and it could do a certain number of operations by itself every scan line and the Amiga would load in some memory into an area where a copper could work with it and after so many instructions like maybe it was 300 instructions so instruction for every pixel on the screen it could sit there and manipulate pixels on the screen inside the copper but once it got through one scan line it would have to resync up with the computer and get the next set of instructions to work with the next scan line that's the reason why you had all those great um, graphics modes on the Amigas to do all fun funky stuff with sprites and stuff was because the guy who had designed the Amiga um, J minor um, that he um, the reason why was because he, he was trying to sync it up with the video and he was trying to make the Amiga do a lot of things with the video signal on a very intimate level um, and the on the Macs you couldn't do anything like you could do on the Amigas because the Macs didn't have that intimacy with the with the um, with the television standard for the for TV monitors so um, it it really the Macs it just didn't make any sense to do any kind of video work with them early on but probably as time got, went on they got better graphics um, cards and things like that the PCs really took off in that area once they got OpenGL and you know did 3D graphics and stuff they they were able to work more and more with video but very early on all the very big graphics companies that we kind of point to today a lot of them got their starts on Amigas um, because the Amigas were designed to work with a video signal and so the video toaster was was um, piggybacked on on the hardware that was already in the Amiga to work to um, create um, its ability to work with video signals but then they had to use something called a time-based corrector to make it so that it would actually work with a VCR and then you could actually do um, all sorts of um, high-level professional video work with it but the uh, Apple computer was really just a hack the the 20 years before 25 years 27 years or whatever that the Mega came after the Apple one the Apple one was designed to just hack um, a TV screen to show characters and graphics and what um, Steven Wozniak did and I, I kind of touched on it they had to address pixels but he didn't want to use he didn't have enough memory to actually work with 32 320 by 200 pixels on the screen even if you could address three colors which would be three bits so maybe it was four bit four bit nibbles at, so this this is how much memory would be required to address that and so we can pop that in here three 320 by um, by 200 times four uh, times a nibble divided by eight that would be 32 32 uh, 32,000 bytes and he didn't have 32,000 bytes to work with so but he wanted character memory so he said okay I, I don't have I don't have 32,000 to work with but what if what if I created some character memory so I this is how character memory works you store for each character that you want to create like an A and A equates to this bit pattern you know it's a graphic bit pattern so that it would be zero 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 on and up here you might have two ones and you'll see what I'm doing after a while here one one so maybe there's one up here zero and now I'm working with graphics I'm actually trying to draw something with pixels and so I get something like this 
and zero zero one and then we got uh and so actually it's probably closer to to that and uh then we get down here to maybe down to here or and uh then we go down here we go one one it may be something like this and so we're actually making a font is what we're doing with so and this is zero zero one one or something like that and what we do is we end up creating eight of these eight lines of these to represent a a simple letter a and we don't have to use memory here we use something called ROM memory that's read-only memory so we actually could save some money by just getting access to a font represented in a thing called ROM. And uh, the ROMs were easy to, or cheaper to come by than RAM. RAM is expensive because it had to, you had to be able to write and read from it. So my, what I imagine is in the Apple one is that he had, uh, he had a uh, terminal ROM that had some memory in it. So he had, a full 256 or it was probably more like 64 characters and that times eight or times uh, well it's 64 times eight so you have eight bytes per character of 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 um pixel memory and so that comes to i'm not very good with math you can tell it by now 64 times 8 and that's 512 so so 512 in 512 bytes actually he probably could have stored that inside of his memory so he might not have used a rom for that but he could he could use a rom so for half a kilobyte he had he had some character memory and then he would reference that character memory by um, to to trying to create tech uh, text on the screen, and I think that his computer had something like it must have been like twenty characters by it may have been twenty by ten characters, and that would be um, two hundred bytes. So he has two hundred bytes. And then you got to have 512 bytes. So in l less than one kilobyte, he can have, uh, he can represent text on the screen. So he could say the quick brown, whatever, you know, fox jumped over, you know, jumped over the blah, 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 you know. And so he could have 10 lines of text this way and 20 characters that way. And he could actually put some text on the screen and what he was doing internally to the to the uh, computer he had um, a he had a function or he had written uh, he had come up not in programming terms but he actually came up with some digital electronics some simple um, he was working with uh, digital circuits what's called TTL circuits and he was working with very basic logic gates and he um, came up with an operation that probably looked like this and what he would do is he would um, he would uh, use um, he would take the clock cycle he'd take the clock that he was trying to sync up with the TV screen and he would um, he would use a modular operator so that's a percent and by eight bits so that that would be each byte that he was reading off so it was actually 255 or two maybe it's 256 so the clock by 256 would determine actually it would be it would be eight so that would determine which pixel he was on on each byte and then then he had clock 
and he would be doing a modulo operation on the line and uh, the line would be he would be doing 8 times 20 so that would be like uh, oh I don't know 40, 80, 160. So there's like 160. So he's doing a clock modulo operator on 160. Something like that. And then he's doing every line on the screen, which would be clock modulo. And um, that would be... Actually, that wouldn't be modulo. This, this would um, actually be divided by the clock and modulo, you know, something like that. So what I'm trying to get at is that he would be syncing the clock and it's like every, he what he would be trying to do is he'd be trying to read out the memory, the, the, the pixel memory. He would reference into the, the texture, me the text memory. And he had in it, um, as I said, it was 64 characters and times eight. So what he would do is for each character, he would read off, he would, he'd go to the text memory. He'd go to the, where the text was stored. So the quick brown fox and then the T he would read off the very tops of the pixels that represented the T. So the, it would be the first eight bits here would be one that'd be the top of the T the graphic T and so he would read off the first character in memory and then from that he could determine um, which byte in the in the memory that represents the top of the T would be these bits and so he'd be syncing up the clock with reading those bits off. And then when it got to the next character, which would be the H, it'd be one, one, zero, 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 zero. And then there would be some one ones because that's the top end of the graphic memory for the H. And so he knew that the next character was gonna be H because um, because he was syncing the, the text memory with the clock as well as the graphics memory with the clock. and but he would he would translate first he had the t and then that would determine what set of bytes to reference for the first scan line and he would sync that up he would run in those bits then he would do these bits for the top of the h and then another set of bits for the top of the e and then nothing for the space and then for the Q, he'd have some zeros and then the one and then some zeros. And then he would have a U, which would be one, one and zero, 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 one, one. And so what it was doing was it was, it would, it would be a simple circuit that all it did was it would determine what the character, what the character. So it would look at the text memory. It determined what character was in text memory. So the D, the T in ASCII code would probably be um, zero, 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 or something, something. We can actually look up ASCII code to see what it is. So we go A, S, C, I, I. And so this is the ASCII table. So I look into the ASCII table. And that'll tell us what our byte reference, how to rec, how to and so he likely used ASCII to represent all of his characters. And if you look at this, oh darn it. If you look at this table, this is a very basic ASCII character table here. And so this is eight bits, or that's, that's eight bit. So this is a 64 character ASCII table. And the first two bits are commands. The next two bits, or let me see the, um, I know that, yeah, the third bit right here, the, the fourth bit 
it represents 0 through 9 and the fourth bit represents a b3 you see this is f right here and the this was designed in such a way that they could easily turn uh, characters uh, representations into hexadecimal so they could just um, do what's called masking off a bit and they could figure out um, what the hexadecimal number was by um, so that was a trick that they could do with bits um, the delete operation was with all bits on so there's the delete and the reason why that is the reason why the delete is all bits on is because they use paper tape and to um, erase a character in paper tape was to pop out all of the holes in the paper tape and that was a uh, delete and so that's that's deletes down there and um so that's that's the the beauty of the ascii um character table but he would have something like this in memory he would have eight bit so he had eight things here and then there would be 16 there so this was Oh, let me see. Yeah, well, it's it's a 64. This is like 128, isn't it? Because that would be 64. But it's 128, the basic ASCII table. So it was 128 instead of 64. I was thinking of very basic, you know, just the main characters, not lowercase, just low uppercase and stuff like that. At the very basic, all he needs is some characters, some some basic characters and some symbols, but none of this other stuff. And so what he was doing is he had a table like this, and he, um, in memory, he had all the graphical representations of this stuff um, stored in memory. And then he was able to determine which character he was drawing based upon um, how he had it stored in memory. And so he had for, it, it's really kind of hard to describe how he did this, but what he did is he synced up the the character memory. He read off the character. If it was an A, he, it, it would, he would know to look in the, the um, memory for the graphical representation of the A and then he would draw off the first line of the A and then the next one so in this case it would be a, a H it would be a T first so he would read off the first character in the text memory and that would determine the graphics memory which um, line he was supposed to read off and he knew he computed what the scan line was it was the first scan line and it was the first character. So he reads off the first character, it's a T. Then he gets the he gets the byte, the first byte, which is the first um, first eight pixels of just one 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 one. And then he would draw that onto the screen at but it would be synced with the with the signal coming from the from the uh, clock and that would be synced to the TV screen and then he would read off the next character which would be H and that would get the in the in the character memory or the the graphical representation memory the first byte which would be the top of the H and it would draw that off and then he would get the next character which would be an E from text memory and that would determine which set of pixels in the graphical memory that he would use for the the character graphic um, memory for the E and then he would draw off those pixels and he had to do that for every single pixel on the screen but what that got him is is that he would not have to he would not have to have like 32,000 bytes of memory he would just have to have um, he wouldn't have to have 32,000 bytes. All he would have to have is about a kilobyte to represent both his graphical memory for his characters, or it would probably be two kilobytes, to represent his graphic 
uh, representation of his characters and to represent the text memory. And then he would just have to make some chips to sync up with the clock and the, or to, to use the clock to sync up with the TV set and then some special logic gates to, to determine which scan line it was on and where the eight pixels at the top of each character it was at and uh, where to read in the text memory the next character to determine what the graphics representation was for the next uh, eight pixels and then uh, to determine where it was with rep reference to the scan line on the TV screen. And he was able to create a graphical display that would represent text memory. And then with the extra bytes that he had left over from, um, he could instead, he could probably use four kilobytes later on the Apple II, he could use four kilobytes and at put in like, um, he would have to have like 24 characters plus lowercase characters, so 48 characters, and then you have to have numbers, so that would be 0 through 9, so there's 10 numbers, so that would be 48 plus 58, and then probably some symbols like question marks and exclamation points. You put those things in, he'd probably end up with 64 bytes, and then he would have another 64 bytes of 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 graphic memory that he could use for graphic characters like um, like um, checkerboard patterns and all sorts of things and then from that you could actually create kind of um, kind of a graphical display on the screen um, on the on the Commodore 64 is what they did is they um, let you reference every I think they they used some sort of character memory and you would actually modify characters and put graphics on the screen using the character memory but um, if you wanted to get pixel accurate you would have to use a portion of your memory for actually drawing on the screen so um, it would be if I I have to do this computation again it would be 80 times um, 25 or no 40 40 characters across the screen times 25 times 8 uh, bytes for um, each line so that's that would equate to how many bytes of of, care, of real memory we'd have to have in order to represent so let me go back here open it up and then we say 40 times 25 times um, times 8 bytes and that's 8,000 so you only need 8 kilobytes of memory to represent one to, to do to uh, reference just this would just be like black and white pixels but to represent to reference uh, four bit, so you need sixteen colors per per character. So you would say times four, so that's sixteen thirty two. So you would have to set aside thirty two kilobytes of memory inside of a Commodore sixty four, which had sixty four kilobytes of memory, just to do graphics. And uh, but on the old Apple ones and Apple twos, they couldn't they couldn't do uh, pixel based uh, they couldn't do actual graphics on the screen the only way you could do graphics was to m modify character memory and then I mean you would make a copy you would use um, a ROM to represent your character memory and then you would have your actual graphical character set in memory which would be um, that would be oh, you doing um, so you had 40 times, let's see, uh, it was 20 characters, uh, no, it was 120 bytes, I'm starting to lose track of what I'm thinking about, 8, so that's, um, 
so you had you would only have about 124 bytes to work with and that's a kilobyte and so you'd only be able to modify that many characters so in one kilobyte you could specify all of your pixels but you could at best only create pictures with pixel accuracy um, 1024 uh, one kilobyte which would be so the log of 20,024 the log 2 is um, a log 2 or, oh, whoops go up here log 2 is so a 10 by 10 pixel array you could do pixel accurate representation of of something inside of a um, inside of a Apple one but um, so you you could create some graphic characters in the Apple one and then draw them on the screen probably but you couldn't do anything you know very complex you could probably create a box on the screen just by creating with some characters the corners of the box and then with some characters you could represent uh, create uh, a, a, a top bar of the box and a sidebar and another sidebar and a bottom bar so you would need about eight characters there and that eight times eight is 64 so 64 bytes you could represent enough a pixel accuracy to represent a box on the screen so you could get something that may have looked like a window and maybe even back in those days if you engineered it right you could probably create a windowing interface but it would be text-based windowing it would look like uh, working on a pc in text mode um, trying to create graphical characters but back then you know just having something on the screen was enough to start programming you could do some graphics programming you could do some sound programming and the sound was the same sort of idea rather than manipulating a video signal you're manipulating an audio signal so you would be trying to access the audio um, feed and I think NTSC included audio as well as video information all in the same signal and so you just had to determine when the audio came in and and what part of that you had to sync the clock signal up to the video and to the audio how to get it all put together and that came from trying to understand the basics of how that stuff works so anyhow i think i've done enough in this video i think i'll quit and go on to something else